I, you know, I have more to say about like Pat's point, but we'll talk about it later. But I think for right now, the, the point just being, I think, you know, following some of these other comments is that when I think about some of my colleagues that I find a little disturbing, and I try to think positively, like, so, okay, what are they about? What are they trying to do in such a different way? I have to recognize that I think they're really worried about being like essentialist and judgmental. You know, and maybe the way they're going about it is not the way that that other generations would have gone about it. But I think they, they've also been very vulnerable because they haven't had a movement to back them. And so I think their experience has been a lot more individual. Mm -hmm. And I think that they have wanted to form multicultural bonds with other people and to kind of show we're not just being, in their own words, narrow nationalists, right? We can self-criticize, we can, you know, we can uh, create like a politics for the present. So I think what's missing from my point of view is um, like that bridge to kind of like show that, talk to that earlier, to that newer generation and show them that the earlier movements were not like really essentialist. Maybe there were people that were, maybe there were one or two or three, but in general, when I look back and read that material, I find like an incredible complexity mm -hmm. and the effort to say, I can't generalize for everyone, so let me speak mm -hmm. about this region. So I just feel like, yes, the getting lost, the complexity gets lost. And, and so even though it might feel tiresome, we still have to bridge, maybe not reinvent the wheel, but bridge, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it feels like people don't get each other and they don't care about each other. Yeah, so I'd like to bring in uh, a sort of other plane that I don't think has been addressed or recognized. And so, so far we are talking about communicating with ourselves in terms of theory and research and that sort of thing. We're talking about communicating, making bridges between our work and the community. We're talking about uh, doing the kind of work that impacts uh, the policy and that uh, maybe can help, you know, uh, generate, regenerate social. But there's a whole other level of power here. And, you know, Gramsci's cultural hegemony. Mm -hmm. And when I think about African Americans and the impact they're having on popular writing, it is significant. Mm -hmm. and, and we try to, try to think about whether or not you know, Chicano Chicana writers are having that kind of impact. It's just not happening. And yet, the reality, uh, the, our reality is, is, is just as significant and needs to be even part of works that are bestsellers. New York Times, because that's where a lot of power is happening. And because of that, it's, it's, it is impacting the positionality of African Americans right now. And some, but somehow, we're not, I mean, those who have been able to, you know, hit that market, and it is a market, um, have been journalists. You know, I think Jean Guerrero, for example, and her, her work on Stephen Miller, maybe uh, some of the writers that have done work on, on the uh, uh, immigrantes experience, Rieta, and so there's, there's been some very incredible work native, by Native American writer, writers that have gotten uh, some, some, some great recognition. Somehow that has to be generated among our canvas too. Uh, because the fact of the matter is, is that if that kid down in Brownville, Texas, is part of the same people as a kid in northern New Mexico, is, is part of the same people of a kid in San Diego, Chicago, and but but do they recognize that? I mean so, and we, so we talk about Chicano and Chicana because we are Chicano and Chicana boom, boomer generation. But I think that the, that, that the label Mexican American is a perfectly legitimate one. And it's possible to use that term and, and be inclusive so that you do have first generation immigrantes at the same time that you have uh, longer uh, term generations. Uh, with, that consciousness has, that's one of the ways that, 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 that power out of writing and scholarship 
can be generated. Now it involves being able to write a certain way. I'm not sure that I'm capable of doing it because even though do, I do a lot of history writing, I, you know, I went through a sociology program and I used it very hard for me to you know, shape the concept of sociology even as an you know, because historians are trained to do the, the, the phrase that I found, literary realism. So there's a bit, you, know, you have to be able to write in a certain way in order to have that level of impact. But I think it, I, I think it is, I, I think it is a form of uh, communication scholarship that that uh, should be attempted by um, someone. And maybe it takes an exceptional sort of writer to do it, but I think it's, it's an important thing to do. Interesting. Go ahead, Lala. Yeah, I just had a quick thought. I was just looking around the table and I was thinking, geez, I'm wondering what, if we, if we were, if we were African Americans and you we were the same age of African American scout was sitting around the table, what would they be talking about their youth? What would they be saying, right? That, that's, you know, it's, I mean, like, what would they say about them? Is, there, is yeah. there's this gap, right? Is there a gap? What you know, all the kinds of issues. But anyway, that's what I was going to say. Uh, so, so it's obvious then from this discussion that that um, you know uh, about you know this this these individuals that you're talking about, these neoliberals and the uh, careerists. Yeah, careerists. That's yeah. the word. Yeah. So, you know, um, and we're we're concerned that they don't have the same consciousness as us, right? But you know, we all came out of the Chicano movement, right? Everybody that's around right. this table. And you know, even before some of us got in academia, right? We're, and even during our careers. So the, the real challenge I think we have, if we could talk about Chicano studies as a program, as an institution, right, in, the, in, our, in, these, uh, in, these, in these universities, how are we going to build consciousness, you know, among our students, right? If they're, if they're gonna come through our programs, how, when they come out, how do we build this consciousness? How does our curriculum, how do we have to change our curriculum? I mean, this is kind of a pedagogical approach, but this, you know, that, that's what I would, I would say, I mean, given our limitations, right? Because we are, we are academics. We are in these high schools of high education. We're not on the streets, you know. We're just not a social movement, per, you know, per se. Um, so I think that's really what our, what our challenge is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and particularly, speaking of, of, of uh, Gramsci, that which is counter hegemonic. Right? Yeah. So let me go to Francisco, and then to Larry, and then to Ed. Yeah, thank you. Bancho, yeah. sorry, I don't think that's great, right? Well, here we go. Here's here. But, um, <laughs> you know, I agree with that, but um, last night in our conversations, uh, I, I was bringing out um, <coughs> uh, a book that came out like 20 some years ago, Assault on Diversity, where I read about uh, a group that was uh, already planning uh, how to overturn the, the New Deal. And, and that planning had been going on and, and had been financed lately by uh, David Koch and, Co and Co his brother. Co and, and, uh, I, I have an accent. So David Koch, you call him? So you hear it any way you want. So, so <laughs> So anyway, good name um, for a prick. <laughs> I think that you know, <laughs> going back to the consciousness, how do we uh, uh, change consciousness? The, the master narrative, the fascistic master narrative that's being uh, written, uh, is financed mm -hmm. by huge amount, billions and billions and billions of dollars mm -hmm. for the last forty years, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and 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 the way that it, it what is resulting in it is. The, the taking over of a lot of legislatures in a lot of states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's part of a grand strategy, and part of the strategy was also mm -hmm. how to change the wording mm -hmm. uh, so that you don't scare people that, that might misinterpret and, and not vote for you. So in order to attract the masses, all of these really <coughs> dark um, uh, uh, intentions have been called a, a, a fight for freedom. And, and that's the key word that they use. So right. people think that they're, they're fighting for freedom, they're actually fighting for their own slave, enslavement. And they're, they're really twisting. I mean, it's very Orwellian, the way that they're twisting not only the values, but they, they're twisting the language. Uh, so 
one of their main objectives, and, and, and this is a big elephant in the room, I think. One of the big objectives is to let capital do whatever the hell capital wants. So, so the, the main problem here is capitalism. And, and, and we're talking about counter hegemony. How are we going to find, how are we going to fight people like, like David, whichever way you pronounce him, and his brother, and all of the people behind them, which have almost infinite resources compared to what we have. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, going, I'm not saying that you know, power is not absolute. There's always a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. But, but we, we can't forget that the main, the main enemy here is capitalism. Mm -hmm. We can't forget that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the robbing of attention of, of the young people, um, I, I refuse to be in a lot of these platforms, social platforms, because they do rob my attention. They're very seductive. And your information. And, and your information, I mean, let alone that, right? But the purpose of that is really to enhance capitalism. I mean, years ago they used to talk about if they could actually put advertising into your dreams, mm -hmm. that, that, that would be like the goal that they wanted. How, how can they advertise their products in your dreams? Well, they're getting really damn close to that. Oh, yeah. I'd like to respond. Yeah. Um, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me respond. Okay, let's respond. Yeah. yeah, I really appreciate what you're saying, uh, Pancho. Um, uh, and, and I think it takes me back to the point of like how policies get made, right? And so the reason that we prevailed, it's in that book, uh, against the State Board of Education was that, that, you know, the rules of the game of how you even have a voice in these spaces are pre structured, they're predetermined. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it is stunning that mm -hmm. it took like 65 years uh, since the founding of the Texas State Board of Education and with people like, you know, Dr. Samora and, you know, your colleagues uh, going uh, and testifying on the Texas history revisions for inclusion, you know, hat in hand, will you please include you know, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, would you please do all of that? It took us, it, it took us like 65 years to realize that actually, uh, we collectively, we actually have to like sidestep that matrix and, and advocate separately for Mexican American studies. And then it became ethnic studies. And it was Arizona that opened up that, that mm -hmm. conceptual pathway and then being involved in community where, and we're a large group where, where we were organized and had these very, you know, very like situated discussions on well, you know, you know, this is going to be our champion on the board, and this is what we're going to advocate. We're going to have a bill in the legislature. We're, we're going to have a, a a media strategy. I mean, it was very very specific, right? And and so uh, we were able to circumvent that that uh, matrix and advocate for what we wanted. And now they're freaking out. That's why now we have the attack on on us. In the gu under the guise of critical race theory, exactly. right? And so, I mean, I think that we've got to get wiser and we have to be involved. We have to be in these spaces. I mean, we, we, we uh, are, are doing our best to fight charter, skill, uh, charter schools, talk about a neoliberal agenda, and many of our colegas have their kids in charter schools, yep. okay? And, and yet that's what is the big undoing of public education right now is the, you know, is the, is the uh, underfunding of public education, and we're overwhelmingly represented, and so it's not, it is capitalism, but it, it's also white supremacy. Oh, no, right. sure. I mean, yeah. it's, the, it's the combined forces of those that, that, that we, you know, I think we need, if, what if we all had a blog, all of us, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think we, what the right Latino does Tokyo. very well, what the right does very well, we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you know, you can, if you, like, ever studied right-wing blogs I have, mm -hmm. they, they look like they cut and pasted the actual <laughs> language from, it gets icky, from but it other? really does look like they cut and pasted from each other's blog, and they use the same words and the mm -hmm. same, you know, alarm bells, and there's many. It's like, you know, they, and, and, you know, and we're not doing that on the left. So people aren't hearing regularly, you know, yeah. from people in this room. You know, I mean, I mean, when we can all be saying the same things, yeah. right? And if they if they start hearing from us, then that helps mm -hmm. to shift the discourse, mm -hmm. right? How do we recapture the narrative? Well, not, we're not going to do it without narrativity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. All right, let me go to Larry and then Ed and then Laura. 
they were not, the point I was going to make was sh shooting off a lava, which is a couple of concepts ago. With the, uh, the whole idea of linking with the community in our preamble, and one of the things that I think Chicano studies slash ethnic studies was a pioneer of and didn't get credit, and in fact, we were looked down upon for doing is what today they call community service learning. Mm -hmm. And we actually had that built into mm -hmm. our classes. We required our students to go mm -hmm. work in the community. Mm -hmm. And all those need areas, and we've right. named them all around the room here. Mm -hmm. And when they go out and do that, and they, they see what's going on there, oftentimes that transforms their career. They become the... Uh, you know, in bother warfare person or the uh, clinica person or the, uh, so that, that piece, I see it sort of disappearing in some Chicano studies programs. Yeah. Um, and I think it really needs to come back in a, in a bigger way and a more, I know San Francisco State has a great model. Where you, yeah, you, it's a requirement. Yeah, it's a requirement and it's built mm -hmm. in. I know okay. students, uh, change their careers and after experiencing it. have embraced it and moved it forward in a really great way. Yeah. That's really awesome. Yeah. But I just want to also throw in for the record, when I was at New Mexico, we had a center called the Resource Center for Gospel Climate. Um, and that's a, a lot of what we, you know, what, what we did, right? So I think that that's, I'm really glad you brought that up, Larry, because that is an important way in which we influence our students to be um, to be engaged. And they drew and did analytical writing. And yeah, and, and went on later on to, as, you know, to be, to be those, important actors. Those, yeah. yeah. No, that's a really important part of our story, I think. A really it takes important a lot work. of development. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of work, but yes. Conscious development as a pedagogical tool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, if, if you try to make it work just by happenstance, it, it, does it, it doesn't work. work. It has to be really yeah. structured and yeah. institutionalized. All right, so who did I say was next? Um, um, uh, Pancho, Larry, Ed. And, and Pat, we're saying their concern about those other colleagues and with, 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 with you know, uh, neoliberal ideas. And it also goes back to what Larry was just saying right now and, and, and do, doing service learning kinds of things. And that's, I mean, to a certain extent, I'm not sure that those are who you're talking about, but in my experience, it's it, it's people that are in other departments, other other departments within the university, where they <coughs> excuse me, where they have to adhere to the norms of the history department or the sociology oh, department yeah. or these other the places. Process. Huh? The tenure process. Yeah, that's right, the tenure process. That in order to succeed, that makes them, if they want to have a career, they have to meet that. And the norm within those other departments is, is a careerist mode. That speaks to the importance, Lord, of creating your own institutions to be able to, to, to establish the service learning kinds of opportunities and to imbue them with the the uh, uh, the ideology, not of the movement. I mean, you have to speak to their experiences and and, and speak to them there. But luckily, there's enough stuff going on. I mean, again, I speak back to our experience with the students at, at, at ASU. When you're living with Joe Arpaio and and Prop and, 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 and SB 1070 and and all of those things, that really speaks to the to these students. And you can reach them, but you, you kind of do it within. It, it, it's much so much easier to do within the the confines of your own institution, where you can reward that, and and and, and, and you don't have to worry about. Uh, 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 and those people don't have to worry about uh, uh, you know meeting the expectations of some alien uh, tenure committee. Yeah, but you can say what you're going to say, and then if you want to say anything else, to sort of to kind of round us out as we move towards um, breaking for a very late lunch. Okay, yeah, no, I just, I wanted to say a couple of things. One, I, uh, I feel like all that I learned as an organizer in the movement 
has been good for me in the academy mm -hmm. because I think I think like an organizer. Mm -hmm. I've never stopped thinking like an organizer, and I've never stopped thinking about how to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And and if you you know my track record at, at Davis will show that, that that's what I that's what I've done. And so I think that's really important. I'm so grateful for that foundation um, that I got from being in the movimiento. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to say is that Jack Forbes, a long time ago, um, mm -hmm. coined the term um, warrior scholar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's something we're, we've, we've brought back and we're using a lot now, cool. again, in Native American studies. I don't agree with everything that Jack Forbes ever wrote, but I, especially as like a not there. But anyway, but but warrior scholar was is a good strong concept, mm -hmm. and Robert Warrior, who's Osage, um, coined the term indigenous intellectual sovereignties, mm -hmm. and and so and of course we use in the United States we use sovereignty because of the nation and nation relationship we have with the United States government mm -hmm. and the treaties we sign and but sovereignty is a loaded term. So I mm -hmm. I actually love the term that's used in Mexico Central and Sud America, which is autonomy. Mm -hmm. With and Emilio mentioned, you know, the idea that we're sovereign and that, that carry ourselves as autonomous beings, right, you know, from our from our communities. And um, I one of the things that I've noticed is on the Davis campus, and I have a feeling this is probably true other places, we do have this Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, right? <laughs> they never bother to ask any of us in ethnic studies <laughs> in our in ethnic studies for anything. That they, they never ask us anything. They That's never, crazy. They never <laughs> think about us. Right? Just go, we're right there, <laughs> right? And I'm just like, you know, it's just, yeah. blow, it's just yeah. mind blowing, right? That they have to have a separate <laughs> office to deal with this when that's what our work is. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to say is that I'm really grateful that at Davis, we chose not to, and I don't know how it happened, in the, I think it probably was the founders of all the programs, which would be Ada in Chai Studies, George Kagawada in Asian American Studies, Forbes and the others at NAS. Um, we, we, were all, we all started as programs and we all became departments. Mm -hmm. And we refused to be collapsed into an ethnic studies paradigm. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, and we've, we all consider ourselves mm -hmm. autonomous departments. We've usually, except recently, we've usually acted in total solidarity with each other. Mm -hmm. and, <coughs> and one of the things that I noticed is that the ethnic studies paradigm <coughs> contains, contains us. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. because in an ethnic studies paradigm, you have this many faculty for mm -hmm. African American studies, mm -hmm. this many faculty yes. for Chinese mm -hmm. studies, this many yes. faculty Native American, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. And with the with <coughs> us as departments, mm -hmm. we don't have to right. even deal with that, right? And so I I think it's really important, mm -hmm. you know, that that we take a look at how it's been devastating to. The NAS, for example, at Riverside, there's like one faculty and mm -hmm. uh, one native faculty in ethnic studies. At Berkeley, there are like three. And I don't know how many in the other sections of ethnic studies, but, but it just, it is a, um, an enforced containment mm -hmm. of, of <coughs> our scholars. So that might be another point for us for conversation mm -hmm. tomorrow on what's happening with Xochitlano studies, ethnic studies departments, mm -hmm. and so on. So many of the conversations we really just began. Um, I, for one, you know, found this um, really wonderful and really appreciate um, everybody's, um, what everybody had to say, everybody's thoughts, and, and I think we have lots of grist for more conversation for the rest of the, the day as well as, as, as tomorrow. Can I so, make just one please prop? Please do. No, go for it. Just a real quick prop, go and that's for the Francisco Hernandez's of the world. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Got up there in the administration. And when they did those programs for equity, and they brought ethnic studies people in to run them. That, that was transformative of the whole university. Oh, yeah. Recruitment, retention, uh, pipeline graduate school. These are the guys that did that. And, and, uh, yeah. and Francisco's a great example of like mentoring that knowledge because mm -hmm. Francisco has sat 
for the last two years, two and a half now, on something new called the Chicanex, Latinx um, yeah. uh, Committee, and it advises the Chancellor and the Cabinet. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many things Francisco shared with us about like just analysis. What is this? Mm -hmm. It's been incredible having him on that committee. So I mean, it's a beautiful mm -hmm. example. It is time for us to reassess our individual and collective steps taken to forge Chicano studies, our relationship to the Chicano movement, so that we can develop and share it how we see fit, whether we want to take this to our own campuses or do what you will. I even mentioned at one point having a PBS special somehow developed from all of this, <laughs> but you know, we're shooting for the sky. But I'll tell you, we have the intellectual prowess here to do whatever we want. 